real thank the organizers and the scientific committee because the, the, the work in, in all these days has been excellent. It was really difficult to organize uh, an online conference like this. And well, the result, I think it's really wonderful. Thank all of you. So, um, well, today is the third session, the last session of the Minico. And well, uh, just let me um, recall uh, what I uh, spoke about in the two first sessions. In the first session, basically what I wanted to do is just to make clear that when you have a classical space time and you have a killing vector field, then all the causality can be uh, characterized in terms of a Finzer metric. Sometimes this Finzer metric is not classical, uh, it's conic, but there, there is always a Finzer metric to study the causality of a classical space time with a killing vector field. Okay. Well, the, in, in the case which is time leg, is, it is easier and, the, and then you obtain a classical Finzer metric. So in the second session, uh, I, I have provide, provided, provided some tools to study Finsler geometry. And what, let's, let us say that the, the important thing here, there were a lot of information, but the important thing here is that all the computations can be done just by fixing an arbitrary extension of the direction where you want to make the computation and then using a, an affine connection. With this, basically, all the computations are, are very, very similar to the computations in Romanian geometry with an affine connections, but, but you have to add some vertical derivatives, okay? Well, uh, well, there was a comment by, uh, a very interesting comment of, uh, by Nicoleta Voiku that, well, maybe you can, you can do the, all these computations with uh, the nonlinear connection. And in many cases, this is true, and, um, and the nonlinear connection uh, is a wonderful tool. But for example, when you want to compute uh, gauss codatz equations, you need to you need the um, the um, um, the second the fundamental. Uh, <coughs> uh, you 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 need the the, um, the the connection in order to to compute the um, uh, second fundamental form of the uh, of the sum manifold, and you do not you don't only need the the, the part that you obtain with the nonlinear connection. You you need all the. I, I think that it, it is not possible to do it without uh, all the information that you get from the um, anisotropic connection from the chain connection. Okay. The, so in the third session, I want to focus in Finsler space times and cone structures. So I'm going to begin with the notion of cone structure. And well, let me begin a very, in a very simple situation. Imagine that you have uh, R times V and you want to define a cone there. Then for example, what I want to, the, the concept I'm interested in is this one. You, you can see the picture. Uh, you take the level T equal one, you make the intersection with this level and you have to obtain something which is uh, strongly convex, okay? In, in the sense that uh, the curvature, the Euclidean curvature is positive, okay? So if this, this intersection is this one. So, um, well, in principle here, uh, the zero section doesn't have to, to, to be inside the, this uh, strongly convex region, okay? But, well, there are some problems. It is very intuitive, this, this definition of cone, but from a formal viewpoint, there are some, uh, some problems. We can, we can do it in a better way because for, to begin with, we need a, a, a splitting, a splitting R times B. So is it possible to do this definition uh, in a more abstract way? Well, we have the, the, the abstract definition. Of course, there are several, uh, conditions, it is more difficult to write down, but we don't need any splitting. Um, well, uh, there are four conditions. The first one is uh, this cone has to be conic. Okay, at one point it's in, in, in the cone, then all the semi-line semi is in the cone. Then it's silent in the sense that if V belongs to the cone, then 
Miles Reed does, does not belong to the cone. Its convex interior, you take, uh, it is the boundary of a convex set. Okay, it is the boundary of a, of a convex set. And it is non radial, strong, uh, strongly convex, in the sense that uh, if you compute the second fundamental form uh, with, with respect to any transversal vector, then it is positive semi, semi, semi definite. It's positive, semi -definite, and this, the radical is exactly the radial direction. Okay, so this is the notion of a cone. Okay, so this is the notion of cone structure of cone at a uh, at a vector space, and then if we want to uh, bring this definition to a manifold, what uh, we need, I mean, uh, at every cone, at, at every tangent space, has to be a, a cone, as in the last definition. But we need a um, transversal condition, which is the, the first one, a condition A. Condition A is well, basically, uh, you need this condition it has to be transverse to the fibers. The, 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 the hypersurface so in, in TM has to be transverse to the fibers. This condition, uh, it appears also, for example, if you consider a Riemannian metric and you want to define the Riemannian metric using the unit bundle. The unit bundle, in order to define a, a smooth Riemannian metric, has to be transversal to the fibers. Okay? Well, um, the interiors of every cone, the union of all these interiors, which is AP, the union will be denoted by A and will, will be important, uh, will be called the cone domain of uh, <clears throat> the cone structure. Okay. So it turns out that with, that with this definition, uh, we can generalize of the, all the causality notions. In fact, if V belong to the Con, belongs to the cone domain, uh, we will say that this tiny leg, this vector is tiny leg, and if V is in the cone, will be light leg. So, well, there are many people that uh, have given contribution to, to cone structures or something similar to cone structures, because uh, this is our definition, uh, the definition by Miguel Sanchez and me, but uh, there are a slightly different definitions, okay? But uh, well, uh, for example, Fatih and Sikonolfi, uh, Minguzzi, Patrick Shaw, McMally, all of them maybe uh, work in a with a slightly different definition, even between them, okay? So well, in our approach, we uh, are we characterize the cone structure uh, with two elements, okay? The first one is a time like a time like one form. What is a time like one form? It's, it's a one form which is uh, positive in every causal vector. Okay, causal, causal vectors are time like which is inside the cone or or, or light like which is in the cone. Okay, so this has to be positive and has to be time like has to be positive in the causal vector. And this is the same thing uh, that the kernel does does not intersect the cone. So the kernel here in the picture, the kernel is is here, does not intersect the cone. And well, the cone is in the positive part of the of omega, omega. Okay. The second element, this is the first element, okay? The second element we will use is a tiny lake vector field, which we can assume that is a omega omega unit, okay? Mm -hmm. Ome omega in t is equal to one. Okay, this is inside. It means that it's a vector inside, inside the uh, cone structure. Uh, is this vector here? According to the cone structure, and well, omega on, on this t is equal to one. Well, you always uh, can find uh, an omega, uh, an, a tiny like one omega form, and one from omega, and an, an omega unit tiny like vector field. But there are many. There are a lot of choices, a lot of different choices, okay? Uh, but the, the important thing, what you can, the important thing that you can, you can uh, make a global choice, okay? At every point, you can make many choices, uh, and in fact, you can uh, match all the choice, uh, all the choices in order to have a, a global, a global choice in all the manifold. So. <clears throat> well, then, well, this is the, the paper that I'm going to follow mostly in, in, in all this talk, in a, in a big part of, of the talk. And then when you have, imagine that you fix, there are many uh, omegas and t's, but if you fix, if you fix an omega 
and a vector field T, uh, then, then there is a, a unique Finsler metric on the kernel of omega, on the kernel of omega, with this property. It has this property, and maybe in a picture you can see better what this uh, property means. This is the same. Um, well, omega T F is gonna uh, is gonna be called a cone triple. It's, it's a cone triple. We will study the cone structures with these cone triples. Well, in the picture, F is given by this. Uh, is the indicatrix of uh, the, the indicatrix of F is, is this subset here, and well, this subset is the projection of the intersection of uh, the cone with the level one of uh, omega. Okay, so th this is the same thing. You can think it's, it, it's, it is easier to think in, in F to think of F like this, like uh, you know, it is the intersection of uh, omega uh, of the level one of omega with um, the cone the cone structure okay so when when you have this cone triple then you can define a lorentz finsler metric in the uh, in the manifold okay you can define a lorentz finsler metric in this way because you have a splitting the splitting is given by the, the splitting of the tangent space is given by the kernel the kernel of the uh, omega the one form and then the the transversal vector t t is a, a transversal vector to the kernel of omega of course and well with this decomposition uh you can define this metric here this metric g the only problem of this metric is that it is it is lorentzian it is always it, it is very easy to see that when you compute the fundamental tensor it is um, of uh, it has index n minus one so it's a Lorentz Finsler metric, but the only problem is that uh, f square is not as smooth as zero. F square is not as smooth as zero at, uh, unless it, it is a, a, a it comes from a scalar product. Okay, so well there is one direction. I mean the the this direction here of uh, the proportional direction to t, in which this metric g is not is not uh, smooth okay but it is smooth in all the other directions okay so well this will be a, a very good tool to make to uh, to make many things so let's go back now to the zermelo problem i spoke about zermelo problem in the first session uh, i well i computed the time using the velocity you know because in, in zermelo problem you fix the velocity but now you don't need anything uh, of that. I'm going to make a, a different uh, deduction of the solutions of the Zermelo problem. And in this case, uh, the velocity, the speed in every direction, can be time dependent. Okay, so let's consider what we want. If we imagine that we are living in, in, in the manifold S, and well, R, R the, the first coordinate, is, is the time. Okay, is the time. So here we are going to define a cone structure okay uh, and this cone structure remember this cone structure can be determined by the omega the vector field t and then the the finsler metric okay because it is equivalent okay recall here that it is equivalent to, to have a cone structure or a um, cone triple the cone triple determines being uniquely a cone structure okay so we only need to uh, to uh, to give a, a, a Finsler metric in the in the kernel of the of the omega, okay? But this is provided by the velocities in the Zermelo problem, okay? Because in the Zermelo problem, we know at every instant t we have a, a hypercentric of velocities, okay? So with this information, we can construct the the code, okay? Because uh, here in in green, in green there are the velocities. Well, uh, well, the velocities are here, but you can transport this to the level one to t equal one, and then you obtain the, the cone. Okay, you obtain the cone structure. So well, we have this uh, cone triple. We have this cone triple where the 
Z is the Finzer metric, which uh, is provided by the maximum speeds allowed in the, in the Zermelo problem. Okay, so we want to use this to solve Zermelo problem. Okay, we have let's say a kind of a space time because now here in this m r times s, we have a cone at every point. Of course, this linear matrix is time dependent. This z is time time dependent. So at every point we have a different cone. It is not. I mean, uh, when you move in t in the uh, integral uh, in, the, in the vertical line, the cones can be different. Okay, but in, uh, uh, in any case, you have a cone structure in, the, in, in this product in R times S. So now, if we want to solve this real problem, uh, we want to depart from a point t zero x an instant. We have to to fix an instant. This is, is here. And we want to arrive to this line, to the line um, in Y, okay, in, in another point. So, well, uh, how can travel for, for X to, to this line? Well, the point is that in, in this kind of non-relativistic space-time, uh, to travel with the maximum velocity is to travel with a causal, causal curve for, for the cone structure, okay? And it is not allowed to travel with uh, uh, non-causal curves because in such a case, I mean, uh, this is the cone. If you if you trying to travel with a, a, a curve which is here, you are traveling uh, uh, faster than the maximum speed allowed. So it is not possible. So the only thing that you can do is to travel from x to y with causal curves. Okay, and well, we want to minimize in, in the middle problem. We want to min minimize the arrival time. Okay, the arrival time. So uh, the point is that we want to. We can travel. I mean, we can travel with light like curves. We, we can travel also with tight like curves. But we, of course, with tight like curves, you you cannot reach the, the the minimum time, the arrival time. So well, we are going to consider light like curves from X to Y, and we want to, to find the solution, which is a, a arrival, the, the minimum possible arrival time, okay? Well, uh, in order to find the solutions, this is just basically, I mean, now the problem is a problem of uh, cone structures. We have a cone structures in R time S. Uh, we know that we can travel with uh, causal curves in, in or, or light like curves better, and we want to find the the minimizing trajectory with all the arrival time. So, in order to find this trajectory, we have to uh, define cone geodesics. A cone geodesic is a, a cone which is locally horizontal. Probably, uh, if you know this concept in, in Lorentzian geometry, you can imagine what, what is in a, in a cone structure. But it's basically is a curve such that locally, locally. Uh, the points are um, are um, in causally related, related, but not chronologically related. There are there is no time like curve from gamma d s to gamma d s uh, prime in, in in a neighborhood. Okay. So, well, uh, it is not difficult to prove using causal reasonings that the solution of the real problem must be cone geodesics. Okay, so basically we have these cone structures, and we have proved that uh, the solution of the Zermelo problem is given by conju is provided by conjugates, and we also have a recall that we also have a, a Lorentz Finsler metric in, in this cone structure. So we have here the first application of um, cone structures you know, to solve the Zermelo problem, and uh, and for example. Uh, to obtain the waveform of a wildfire, okay, when, when the wind is time dependent. Okay, so um, now let's go again to things with space times. Um, so the first question is why to study things with space time? Well, I think that things with space time is kind to play when there is sun and isotropy, okay. And this can happen, for example, in, uh, in the standard model extension uh, developed by Kosteleski. Uh, he really obtains pseudo-finzer metrics as, as effective models. 
Also, for example, if you consider, you consider relativistic uh, kinetic gases, uh, this is a, a work by uh, Hoffman, Pfeiffer, and Voiku. And of course, there are, as we have seen, we have just seen there are other applications rather than, than cosmology. For example, uh, the time dependence and real problem and wildfires and so on. So, which is the best way to define a, a thing of space time? Okay, uh, well, we need two types of vectors, like this and, and tiny, to distinguish massive, uh, massive uh, objects. We need also curvature in order to model, model gravity, and uh, maximization property is, uh, is very welcome. Hmm? So, well, in principle, if we want to define the, the length of curves and, and to define curvature, we need a pseudo tensor metric. And in order to uh, in order to have this property of local maximization, we need um, well, uh, we need a Lorentz Stevenson metric in the sense that in order to have this local maximization, the index of the uh, of the pseudo Finsler metric has to be n minus one. Uh, n minus one because I, I'm assuming that l is positive. Okay, so the index is the opposite as uh, when you consider tiny vectors negative. Okay. So then, uh, the domain of this uh, Lorentz Finsel metric has to be convex, saline, and connecting. And this is implied. This is implied by the first property. Uh, if you make some assumptions of completed conditions on on the boundary of A, okay, and then L uh, extends as zero to the closure uh, of of this domain. Basically, what you have is that you have defined the Lorentz Finsel metric in a constant structure, okay? The, the boundary of the boundary of A of this domain is a constant structure, okay? And well, we here don't have to introduce the tan orientation because this is implicit in A. A, it's only, uh, it has only one, one connected component, okay? It's connected and well, uh, Notions of causality are very easy to, to define because this time like if it's in A in the this interior domain and it, it is likely it is L along V is zero. Okay. Okay, in A, L is always positive. And well, in the boundary is zero. Okay, so we have the, the notion of time like a, and like vectors. And this this matches very well with constructors. Okay. So there are many definitions. I don't want to to, to lose. A long time with this, but well, in some definitions, for example, Bean probably was the, the first definition of field space time. He considered uh, the whole tangent bundle a sum of only tiny vectors. Faith and Wolf are, um, are homogeneous functions. Kostodisky um, found a very different um, <clears throat> expressions of, for, for the metrics, in, in, and in some, in some cases, the, the, the metric, the, the, the pseudo Finsel metric was not. Or, or, or Lorentz type. Lamersal, Perlick, and Hasse well consider uh, pseudo Finsel metrics, which are not uh, smooth, uh, are not smooth everywhere. There are some directions where are not smooth. Like, like for example, the, the fair example we saw just a few minutes ago. And also with uh, Amir Azami, we consider examples which uh, are only, uh, are only uh, smooth in the light, like directions and then uh, well the indicative has to be convex because we in in this paper with azami we we wanted to put the uh, sing, uh, singularity uh, the uh, penrose singularity theorem okay so we only needed the the, the smoothness in, in in the cone okay but well we are going to use a, a, a this definition that i just Given this definition, I think that it, it appeared first in this paper in collaboration with Miguel Sanchez. And well, in this definition, the, why to, to choose why to choose this definition? Because uh, causality does not depend on what happens outside the causal console. So if, if does not depend, then I, I don't care about the metric there, and I I'm only interested in the metric in the causal console, so inside in, in time lake and light directions. Okay. And on the other hand, uh, of course, smoothness is important because if you want to compute like geodesics and it, it, you, you want a maximizing pro property uh, of geodesics, you need 
the index in minus one. Okay, so this is the first result I want to present that um, locally, locally, uh, causal geodesics are 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 maximized are the unique maximizers of the Finzer spice locally. Okay, uh, I prepared a proof, but uh, I think that I don't have time to to give all the details. But just in order to prove this, that geodesics, causal geodesics, are locally are uh, the unique maximizers of the Finsler separation. Yeah, well, there are several. Well, one very important thing is the reverse fundamental inequality. It's like the reverse Cauchy's bar inequality. Okay. Then also there is a, an important point that is uh, that when we uh, take the, the exponential, uh, if um, Beta, if beta is a curve in the in the tangent space, uh, which is in the um, which is in, in the cone in, in, inside the cone of the of this tangent space, then the image is is is, is also in the causal cone. The image of this beta, uh, I know, it's, uh, sorry, it's, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. If alpha is a causal curve alpha the, the image by the exponential of beta is a causal curve then beta remains in the causal cone of, of, of the tangent space okay so this is a generalization of the classical case so uh, in, some, in, in that sense it's not so interesting um, and then all the proof can be done in in, in in a similar way to the classical case for example if you have a a causal curve which is not a prejudicic, then it can be approximated by time like curves from alpha of a to alpha to, to, to the end points arbitrarily close to, to alpha. Okay, this is you can find a proof of this in, in the paper with Amir Azami. And well, then the, the proof uh, follows, follows the same lines as the classical one. Basically, you have to use the uh, reverse fundamental inequality and the Gauss lemma. Yes. This is the two main ingredients, maybe, of the proof is to use the reverse fundamental inequality and the Gauss lemma, which are uh, which are whole, both of them holding in the for Finsler space time. Okay. So um, let me continue with examples. Well, uh, the main reason to use several definitions uh, uh, for Finsler space times are the examples uh, or, or the lack of them because it was difficult to find. Uh, examples of uh, things with space times. Here, there are several of them, and uh, all, all these examples that I don't want to comment in detail have different properties that bring to to to, to some people to make different definitions of things space times. Okay, but my main goal is to to introduce here uh, a big class of uh, new examples. Okay. And this can be done in a very easy way because you need uh, a omega, a one form, and a Finsler metric. Okay? You consider omega and a Finsler metric. Then you consider the level one of omega, the level one of omega, which is uh, W, capital W, and then the, the indicatrix. Is the, they intersect transversally in a connected compact subset. Then this, this expression here, is a Lorentz Finsler space time. Okay, it is a Lorentz Finsler space time in this domain. Okay, so I think well, this is very similar. It, it remains. Uh, uh, it reminds. It reminds the uh, uh, static Finsler space time, but is is quite different because here, in in the static Finsler space times, this f here is defined in a slice. Is a, a Finsler metric in a slice, but here, this f is defined in the whole in the whole product. Okay, so it, these two definitions are, are are very different. Okay, and then this condition of uh, inter the condition of intersection is very easy to satisfy, and the best way to see this in, is in a picture. Okay, so uh, imagine that you have a uh, you have uh, the the indicators of a conic of a Finsler metric or, or a Minkowski metric. We are in a vector space, so this is the indicators of a Minkowski metric. Then you consider this is the 
level one of the uh, one form, and well, the intersection has to be a strictly convex, uh, compact uh, uh, hypersurface in, in in this hyperplane. Okay, so basically, this define a cone structure. Okay, so the only problem here, the only problem in, uh, in that the, this condition, the condition of transversality is not satisfied. Is when well maybe if you uh, rather than a, a Minkowski uh, norm, you consider a, a cone Minkowski norm. There, there can uh, be several problems, but if it is a Minkowski uh, norm, the only problem is that maybe this level here is is very high and that doesn't touch the indicatrix. But in such a case, you can multiply the one form by a. a mm, constant big enough and then at, at some point we'll cut the we'll cut the, the, the indicatrix okay so the, it is very easy to generate examples in the way in this way okay so well in fact how to prove that this is Lorentz Finzer metric well I don't want to uh, to give many details because I, I don't have time but the point is that it is very easy to compute the fundamental form of this uh, Lorentz Finsler method, or the pseudo Finsler method. The fundamental form is this one. And then you have to check that this is, uh, well, of Lorentz Finsler type, okay? But you have a lot of information because uh, the kernel in, in GB, in the kernel is negative, is negative, is negative defined. Because of course, in the kernel, this part is zero, and this is the fundamental tensor of a Finsler metric. So here is uh, there is uh, an n minus one space uh, subspace uh, a hyper uh, hyperspace where GB is negatively defined, but there is also uh, one direction where it's positive. So it has to be uh, Lorentzian. The index has to be n, n minus one. Well, in the in the boundary is a, is a little bit more difficult, but it, it works. Okay, so we have a large class of uh, examples of Lorentz Finsler metrics, and in, they can be expressed in a, in a very easy way. Okay, so well um, here, well, it is, this is just uh, to say that if. Well, this is empty. This region could be empty. This is the case in that the level one doesn't touch the indicatrix. Okay, this case when, when this is empty. But in such a case, you can multiply by a function, and then at, at some point, uh, the level one will will cut, will intersect the, the indicatrix, and then you have a, a Finsler space time. Okay, so there are many Finsler space times in this way. You can take take you can consider many different examples i don't want to uh, to spend much time here you can make uh, well cro also crop in you know, another different of things as a particular examples uh, much more metrics uh, alpha beta metrics quartic metrics there are many many examples you can generate a lot of examples in this paper uh, that i used in the first uh, talk a lot you can find a, a way to generate a lot of uh, examples of things classical things metrics Okay, you can do also perturbations of uh, um, classical Finsler space times because uh, a, a Lorentz metric can be always expressed in this way. And then, then you can, let's say, you can perturbate this part here with a Finsler metric. Okay, so at the end, you did something like this. Okay, and this is the perturbation. I, imagine that you want to. Well, I, I want to take a classical space time, but I want to modify, I want to prepare to pay this space time uh, to a Finsler space time. This is a way to do it, okay? Using this, this, this family of examples. Okay, so, well, we have given uh, many, uh, many examples, but the point is, is it possible to characterize all the examples of Lorentz Finsler metrics, the answer is yes. And the first tool to, to do that is this proposition in that basically, uh, if you want to, to check that a Lorentz Finsler metric is of index type, the, the only thing that you have to do 
is to uh, to compute the angular metric, compute the angular metric, which is defined like this, where GB is the fundamental tensor. And then you have to check that this is negative semi-definite with radical span by D. Okay, it's always is more, it's, it is uh, is easier to check that something is or post negative definite or positive definite of the origin and type. Okay. Then, well, in the boundary is a little bit more complicated. You have to use this one form here, and you have to see that well, this restricted to the kernel of uh, the fundamental tensor restricted to the kernel of this one form is negative semi-definite semi with radical span by, by, by D. Okay. So, but the important thing is that, uh, in some sense, this is a very good proposition, a very, very good tool to check if a particular Lorentz pencil metric, uh, a particular pseudo pencil metric is, is, is a Lorentz pencil metric. Okay. And this, uh, with this proposition, we can characterize all the uh, possible uh, Lorentz pencil metrics. Okay. All of them can be expressed in this way. Okay. Can be expressed in this way. Like a Riemannian metric, a Riemannian metric minus a classical pencil metric. Well, uh, Conic things are metric, okay? Doesn't have to be defined in, in, in the whole tangent bundle. So all of them can be expressed like that. There are some additional conditions. This is a little bit technical, so I'm going to uh, skip this. But the idea is that, well, uh, you can obtain every um, Lorentz tensor metric using a Riemannian metric and a, and a conic tensor metric, okay? So now, or all the examples are, are very well understood, uh, all the examples of Lorentz and Zermatic. So I'm going to skip the proof because I want to have more time to the last part, which I think is very interesting. Well, let me just give uh, the definition of uh, stationary things of space time, which is something very interesting. So uh, consider a product manifold R time, times S. Well, a, a stationary things of space time is a, a things of space time that admits a, kilo, a tiny kilometer field, okay? So what I want now is to, to give some examples of this, okay? Well, I was thinking how to generate such examples in, a, in an easy way. And this is one, for example, uh, well, I, I will say that uh, a stationary space time is a standard if uh, in partial T, well, T is the first coordinate, See, if partial T is the tiny killing, killing field, okay? Killing field just means in this context that the, the flow, uh, the flow of the killing vector field preserves the Lorentz tensor metric, okay? So how to generate these examples? For example, what you can do is to, con to consider a classical tensor metric on R times S, such that partial T is a killing vector field, okay? You can consider classical tensor metric, there are many examples, um, if partial t, if f of partial t is less than one, then this function here is a stationary space time. Okay. So this condition on partial t is not restrictive because it, if it is not true, then you can multiply a partial t by a, a small uh, <clears throat> a, a, a constant, a small constant, and then you you can obtain this. Uh, um, this condition. Well, uh, another thing which is very interesting is that uh, this projection here, this projection from Rs to S, is a pseudo finster metric. It's a pseudo finster mesh. Sorry, I, I haven't defined what, what, what is a pseudo finster mesh, but basically, in some sense, uh, it is a uh, it is a map such that the differential preserves uh, the uh, the horizontal the norm of horizontal vectors okay so i have to define horizontal vectors i, I, I haven't done that but okay well i don't have time to do uh, that right now okay but it is this is very remarkable because then if you obtain the fundamental equations of O'Neill for for a, a pseudo finster summation you can apply these equations in order to compute the curvature Okay, the curvature of, of this space time. And this can be of interest in, in things like space time because, uh, I mean, if you want to find exact solutions, you will need to, to compute the curvature, okay? So this can be a, 
a way to configure the curvature of some interfield examples, exact solutions, totem exact solutions. Okay, so well, we have um, now imagine that you have two uh, Lorentz Kinsler metrics. We say that they are anisotropically equivalent. If there is a, a smooth function such that uh, one is the uh, multiple of the other one, okay, L, L2 is equal to mu times L1, okay. So it turns out this is a very interesting theorem that two things and metrics are, uh, or two Lorentz things metrics are anisotropically equivalent, are multiple one on the other, even only if their associated constructors are, are equal. Okay. Well, as I don't have time, enough time, I'm going to skip all this. Well, um, let me say just that um, <clears throat> given a con triple, a con triple, you can define this this metric here. I, I, I did this at, at the beginning of the talk. And then I, I've said that this is not a smooth in one direction, okay, in the direction of t. Okay, in the direction of t, this is this metric is not as smooth uh, if it is a thing that is not Romanian. But you can, in some, some sense, um, a smoother this, okay? You can smoother this. There is a uh, what we do is to uh, consider the indicatrix. The indicatrix is not as smooth uh, at one point, but we make a, a, a smoothing procedure and obtain a, a, a smooth indicatrix, okay? In, in, and in, in this way, this is well, in this way, we can obtain. Uh, given a constant structure, we can obtain a, a smooth Lorentz Kinsler metric defined in, in, in all of, of Tn. Okay. So, in in some sense, in some sense, the conclusion I'm going too fast here. But the only idea that I want to transmit in this part is that given a constant structure, there, there is always a smooth Lorentz Kinsler metric. Okay. And there is one which is very easy to produce, but it's not smooth in one direction. Okay, this is the conclusion. And then, of course, uh, you can relate the cone geodesics with the lightweight geodesics for the Lorentz Kinsler metric. They coincide up to parentization. Okay, they coincide up to parentization. Yeah. So, uh, if you want to solve the Zermelo problem, you can compute the lightweight geodesics of the Lorentz associated Lorentz Kinsler metric. Okay. So, well, there are here these two papers where the, the lightweight geodesics of uh, of the cones are of the manifolds with the same cones are are, are studied in the, in the first paper we studied also the the conjugate points the invariance of the conjugate points in, in the second paper well it is a very very nice study from a very different perspective perspective but with a, a very powerful tools okay by omid mcmalley so with with all this it turns out that you can solve the zermelo problem you can solve the Zermelo problem using basically causality, okay? And maybe I don't want to give many details, but well, uh, you know, we have said that already that um, this solution to Zermelo problem using the, the, the cone structure associated to the Zermelo problem uh, is always a conjodesic and then a light geodesic of, of a certain Lorentz Kinsler metric. But the point is that we can find a global minim, minimum if uh, the cones, the uh, causal cones are closed, okay? This is the same as causal simplicity of classical space times, okay? And well, in some situations, this can be, I mean, when the metric set, the, the, the time dependent metric is upper bounded uh, by any T independent things like metric, then you can guarantee this. Okay, so there are ways to to ensure that the Zermelo problem has has solutions. Okay, and all the critical trajectories of the arrival time functional must be conjugates, not only the minimizers. Okay, this all this can be uh, checked using can be put using causality and relativity relativistic Fermat principle by by Perley. Okay. So let's go to the last part, the foundations. And here in, in foundations, uh, I want to recall the axiomatic approach by Ehlers, Pirani, Child. In this axiomatic approach, they prove several things. They, they begin, they start with some actions and they 
in first in, in, in a first step they prove that uh, this space time has to be a manifold using uh, messages and echoes uh, between particles rather coordinates okay this is the first point then uh, they uh, prove that the space time is endowed endowed with a projected structure uh, well uh, with some uh, axioms uh, uh, <clears throat> which model the free fall of particles, space-time is a vile space in the sense that there is an affine connection compatible with the cone structure, uh, and space-time is endowed with a tan oriented Lorentz metric G up to an overall constant scalar factor. So it seems that they exclude Finsler space-time, but there are some issues here. Hmm? But because why, how they exclude Finsler space-time? Well, the first point is that they assume that well there are two functions that this, this rather coordinates and they assume that this product here is c2 but as was argued by uh, lammers and perley there is no reason to assume that this this product here is c2 differentiable because t t on t is not differentiable but this product is differentiable and in this happens only with scalar, uh, scalar products so there is no reason to to make this assumption Okay. Well, the other question is that um, uh, they uh, endow the space time the, uh, spend with a projective structure. Okay. And this is done with this condition here. There exists coordinates in such a way that um, you have this, uh, this condition. Uh, they, this is a, a something as an infinitesimal law of inertia. And this is very reasonable. But this is equivalent to the existence of normal coordinates in Finsler geometry. And the main problem is that the Christoffel symbols of an anisotropic connection are not smooth at the origin unless it is an affine connection. It happens something similar to what happens with the F square. Okay. So, well, um, uh, you, I mean, uh, you can using this you can um, deduce deduce that there is a, a an affine connection which is not an isotropic but it, there is also there is again a problem of differentiability okay <clears throat> you can find this in, in this paper here uh, by in collaboration with bernal and, and sanchez and um, well there is a way to um <clears throat> To give a counterexample to uh, Ellis Piranchil approach. And this is given here in this paper. Uh, they found a thin space time which satisfies all the action because the lightly cones are the lightly cones of, the, of this thin layer space time are coincide with the lightly cones of, of our metric. And it is very well, so uh, the geodesics can be computed with an affine connection. So in, in this case, this is a really a, a counterexample. Okay. Even there's no problem with the issues, the, the two issues that I have commented. Okay. So we are arriving to the end. And now I want to to, to ex explain why we should consider field space things as com cosmological models. Okay. We have seen that EPS does not really exclude things as space time. The universe could have a, an astropis. Uh, I have discussed several cases in which, in which this can happen. And well, the classical models work quite well in small scales, but there are some problems in, 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 in bigger scales. And these problems right now, I think that nobody knows how to, uh, how to solve these problems. And physical geometry could be an answer because what happens in big scales? Maybe, maybe there could be a cumulative, cumulative effect. So the point is that we need models to be tested. We, didn't, we need models to be tested. And of course, we need Einstein equations for post space time. So, in order to introduce Einstein equations, let me define the Ricci scalar. That is, it is a trace of the curvature tensor. In the second, in the second session, I defined the curvature tensor. Then, uh, with this trace here, you define the Ricci scalar, which can be interpreted as an average of the flat curvature. Yeah, with flat ball, flat ball V. Well, a first approach to uh, the, the Einstein's equations was given by Woods in 93. 
um, she proposed to study R equals zero, the scalar, the rich scalar equal to zero as Einstein's vacuum field equation, because this is related with the division of geodesics and so on. But in this paper here, which is very interesting by uh, Homan, Pfeiffer, and Voiku, they uh, they prove that the <coughs> roots equation cannot be the only Lagrange equations of uh, a Lagrange, a Lagrangian. Okay. So how to consider a Lagrangian in order to, to obtain Einstein equations? Well, you can consider, for example, this. It, it is it is tricky. Uh, I think that later. Uh, Nicoletta Boiku will speak uh, with more details about how to do that. Uh, and basically, you have to make the integration uh, in, in, the, in the tangent bundle. Here, I have put indicatrix. It can be uh, a quotient bundle or, or something like this. But, well, you have to make a, one very natural, uh, natural uh, functional is to consider the integral of the rich scalar. Okay? And then, in order to write down the... Uh, the Einstein equations, uh, you need to define this. Uh, I, I recall this. I, I have defined this uh, Landsberg tensor in the, in the second session, but this, which is defined using the Berwell, Berwell tensor. The Berwell tensor was the, the vertical derivative of the Berwell connection. And then the Agbar Rasade Ricci tensor, which is the second vertical derivative of the Ricci scala. Okay. Using these uh, elements, uh, Pfeiffer and Wolfer in 2012 obtained uh, this Einstein equation, okay, which is the Einstein equation associated with this uh, Einstein, let's say, generalized Einstein Hilbert functional. Here, uh, probably Nicoletta will not recognize this equation because I, I've written this equation in, uh, in my terminology. But well, this tensor T here, there are some traces, and these two traces are metrical, okay, are computed with GD. And well, the tensor T is a tensor, is is uh, is a long expression, but everything depends on the Landsberg tensor. Okay, everything depends on the Landsberg tensor. This the, the LT is the trace, uh, the metrical trace of the Landsberg tensor too. So so this is the Einstein equation, and it's, it turns out that this it's very difficult to obtain exact solutions. And this is one of the problems of Finsler space times. So uh, one of the projects that I think that is, uh, it, is, uh, it is difficult, but it's very interesting, is to, get, to obtain exact solutions of this, of this Einstein equation. Some comments to, to finish. Just, uh, there are other approaches to, to Einstein equations. For example, Arbaxa there in 95, Obtain this equation, which is more similar to the Pascal one, but David Bau um, found some possible gaps in, in the deduction of the equation as an only Lagrange equation. Okay, so it is not clear since that there are some gaps, but uh, I haven't studied the problem in detail. And also, there is another paper uh, by uh, uh, Bing Chen and Ji Bing Chen from 2008, where they studied Einstein equations for the positive definite case. Okay. I, I think that the, the equation is very similar to the one of Pfeiffer and, uh, and Warfare. Okay, so just, just to finish, well, what we have done today is to, to study cone structures. Uh, we, are, we have characterized cone structures with cone triples, and then they associate the Zermelo problem. Uh, and we have uh, solved the Zermelo problem using space times. In some cases, the space time can be a classical space time. Okay, so it, it is very interesting because you can, for example, apply this to uh, wildfire when to, to, to compute the wave front of a wildfire uh, when the wind or the conditions are, are time dependent. Okay, so we have provided a large amount of examples of uh, smooth field space time. In fact, we have given a characterization. And well, uh, the important thing now is that we have to, to, to find examples to test the theory. Mm -hmm. And well, the Mello problem can be used, can be solved using causality, and of course the most important thing, uh, the exact solutions of Einstein questions uh, should should be obtained to test the, the models because otherwise we cannot know if uh, it is impossible to know if the Finsler space times can give a, a different answer of uh, answer. Uh, 
to the problems of uh, the models of space times in, in, in big scales. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for, for your attention.